Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you, Alexandra, for the introduction there. So first, I want to give an acknowledgement to the traditional territory on which the University of Guelph resides. So that's of the Attawandaran people and the Mississaugas of New Credit. Um, I also offer, want to offer respect to our uh, Métis, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee neighbors. Um, so I'm really happy to see the turnout today. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, I did anticipate this. The title of this talk would bring uh, quite a few folks in, so thanks for that. Um, but I want to start out by telling you what this, um, what this talk is not going to be about. Um, so first off, I'm clearly not going to be able to talk about all different Indigenous worldviews. Um, so just within Canada alone, we have over 630 separate First Nations. Um, so it's just beyond the scope of one person and, of course, with the, with the time that we have. Um, secondly, I don't think it's necessarily appropriate for me to talk in any great detail uh, at this stage of, uh, anyways, about other cultures beyond my own. Uh, so the scope of this talk will be highlighting more the broader, more general aspects of the traditional relationship that Indigenous peoples had with animals. And I'll do that within a North American context. Um, I'll give some interesting examples. Well, I think they're interesting. Um, throughout the presentation, and then I'll end with a story. Um, but above all else, what I'd like you guys to understand here today um, is just to realize how varied worldviews are across different cultures, um, even within our own country, and uh, how significantly they really shape our relationships. So not just with animals, but with the land, and of course with each other. So I'm going to start out by talking about terminology. So this is going to be our common terminology in Canada. Uh, and I'll do it in kind of a historical uh, context. I really think it's important to use proper terminology when we're discussing any Indigenous issue. Uh, it's definitely seen as a sign of respect to the people themselves. Uh, likewise, uh, it's really important to make every effort to pronounce Indigenous names correctly. Um, I think it goes a long way when we're trying to build relationships with Indigenous people and, and Indigenous communities um, and in fostering that process of reconciliation. Um, I definitely realize indigenous names can be difficult to pronounce. I have problems pronouncing English, English words all the time. So, um, but a lot of the reasons why those names are difficult to pronounce is because they have unfamiliar syntax sometimes associated with them. Um, and that syntax can be specific to that language. So I think it's really important for us to realize um, that right across Canada, what I would call is uh, there's a crisis kind of occurring. Uh, where nearly almost every indigenous language um, is either endangered or um, on the brink of extinction. So uh, here's a visual representation of the different indigenous languages across all of North America. Uh, but in Canada alone, we have about 60 indigenous languages that are still being spoken. I'm sure there was many more originally. Um, uh, but when you take into account the different dialects that, uh, that, that there are now, there's over 90. Um, so for many reasons, including the fact that um, children were not allowed to speak their indigenous language when they were in the residential school system, and because many of the speakers right now are at a very advanced age, um, and then also because we have a lack of funding to support these languages, um, I think it's UNESCO that predicts that only about three of these 60 um, are going to survive if we don't make attempts to preserve and utilize them. So suffice to say, uh, Indigenous peoples are very protective of their language um, and the proper use of their names, pronunciation, um, and I just felt that was an important point to mention. So getting back to the terms here, our terminology, um, I'm sure everyone is very familiar with the story of Christopher Columbus uh, arriving in the Americas in 1492, believing that he had found India, uh, and hence came the name Indian. Uh, so he called the indigenous people of North America Indians. Clearly, that was a large inaccuracy. But, um, of course, it stuck with both the colonizers and the governments that followed. Um, so using the term Indian in everyday conversation is, uh, most of us probably know, it's unacceptable and uh, can be offensive. I just want to say that many people will refer to themselves um, as Indians or all of the other terms that I'm going to mention here. And that is just something we have to respect. Um, but uh, anyways, the term Indian is still used legally in Canada, and that's because, uh, mainly because of the Indian Act. So that was introduced in 1867 in the main statute through which uh, the federal government uh, administers Indian status and also manages nearly every aspect of life for First Nations people. Um, it's been amended numerous times, uh, but it's still considered by some scholars to be the most racist form of legislation still in use on a global scale. So... Indian was 
oh, sorry, within the legal context, Indian was originally meant to refer to First Nations people, but then in 1939, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada made a ruling and placed Inuit also within the realm of Indians, and so they were under federal jurisdiction. Uh, and then last year, the Supreme Court of Canada, again, with the Daniels decision, uh, put Métis people uh, within the classification of Indian, uh, meaning that we're also under federal jurisdiction. Uh, but obviously, because of all the negative connotations with the, the word uh, Indian, we started using the term Native um, to describe First Nations people. Um, that's fallen out of use, and I think it's because it's just too broad of a term. Really, no matter what your heritage, um, every person is native to some place. They, they've originally come from some place. And so in Canada, we don't, we don't tend to use that word anymore. Um, incidentally, in the U.S., uh, the common terminology for Indigenous people is Native American. Um, and it's my knowledge that that's widely accepted there. Um, but anyways, in 1982, we adopted the Constitution Act, uh, which used the word Aboriginal to uh, designate all three groups, Métis, First Nations, and Inuit. Um, incidentally, uh, Section 35 of the 1982 Constitution was the first ever law to protect existing Aboriginal rights in Canada. So many people still use that term interchangeably with Indigenous. Um, until fairly recently. I'm probably going to accidentally use it, even though I don't need to in this presentation, and that's just out of habit. So we've had the word Aboriginal around for a long time. So rather recently, different Indigenous groups have begun to outright reject the term Aboriginal. So they've passed resolutions to not deal with any organization or any government um, that uses the word. Uh, so for example, the uh, Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs and then the Anishinaabek of Ontario. So that's about 42 separate First Nations. Um, have officially rejected the term Aboriginal. So now, we commonly use Indigenous. So that's the word we use, um, just so we're all on the same page. Um, that's my little side lesson today. Um, uh, but when, really when we're talking about any specific First Nation or specific group, we really should be as specific as we can and um, use the name that they call themselves, right? Uh, and if you don't know how to pronounce it, just ask. Everybody is fine with that. Um, but essentially, many of the issues relating to this terminology and why it's always such a contentious issue, it's not about the specific wording. It's really about reclaiming identity. So in a cultural sense, you can appreciate that all these terms, Indian, Native, Aboriginal, um, they've all deprived those Indigenous groups of their identity and forced them to adopt a new one. Um, so just being specific is the right way to go. So moving on to finally to worldviews. So, um, what are worldviews actually? So here's a really long definition. I'm not going to read the whole thing out. Um, it's fine for our use today. Um, so essentially our worldview is our perspective from which we see and interpret the world. Uh, it shapes all of our beliefs and our values. Um, worldviews are transmitted uh, socially uh, through processes like learning from your peers, learning from your family, and then of course through the educational system that you uh, go through. So within a culture, generally everyone will have the same worldview. But then if you become ingrained in another culture, uh, you might also begin to see the world through that lens, if you will. So I would say that I look at the world and I look at issues through my Métis lens. Uh, but because I was also formally educated in our dominant uh, Western education system, I also see the world through, uh, through that lens as well. So it's important to remember that worldviews are not necessarily static and they can evolve. Um, and I think for those of us that are going through the process of decolonization, our Indigenous worldview necessarily expands um, as we learn more about the world in that different way, so in an Indigenous way. So, going on, why are worldviews important? Um, and particularly uh, how we view animals and then also how we treat them. So this is a very simplified diagram I'm, I'm using to explain this point. Um, worldviews shape our attitudes about all issues, and so they necessarily shape our, um, our ideas about animals and therefore uh, ultimately shape our behaviors towards animals. So being a scientist who studies animal behavior and animal welfare, uh, I'm really interested in looking at these non-dominant worldviews, um, and in particular those that are held by indigenous peoples. Um, I also think it's interesting to mention that I think there's a big resurgence in finding alternative approaches for how we think about our place on this planet uh, and how we care for the environment and we care for the animals and all the other creatures. And so from that perspective, I think uh, there's a lot of interest in examining these uh, indigenous worldviews. So now I'm going to tell you a story. 
this isn't the end of my presentation, it's the story in the middle of my presentation. Um, so I have a friend and colleague, colleague. Um, she's a world-renowned human rights and indigenous lawyer. Uh, so she travels all over the world by invitation uh, working on these issues. So anyways, she was um, took part in a massive negotiation between numerous indigenous groups, and I'm not going to say the name of the corporation, but they're the largest diamond, diamond mining corporation in the world, so you might be able to figure that out. Uh, this is when they began development on a massive open pit diamond mine in the north. So this is in Canada. So around the table in one of these sessions, there were numerous languages being spoken. Everybody had headsets um, so that they could hear the translations, right? Um, and then an elder began to speak. Uh, and he was speaking in defense of the caribou and the wolves uh, that were going to be dis displaced with this development. So ultimately, that meant that the ability for those people to harvest the caribou would be impacted by this mine. Uh, so he started out by saying, uh, we are the caribou, and we are the wolves. And so everyone immediately looked around, and they're taking off their headsets, and they're thinking, you know, something's wrong, translation's wrong, uh, what's going on here? Um, <laughs> But uh, the elder was saying exactly what he wanted to say. Um, there is nothing wrong with this translation, of course. Um, the people of that culture, they literally believe that they're going to be transformed into those animals, uh, wolves or, and caribou, in their following lives. And so they see it as a responsibility in this life to protect them. Uh, and the whole natural dynamic that they share, right, in this life. And so now I want to ask you, um, what would you think of me sitting here, uh, you know, right now as an indigenous person, and if I said, I believe I'm a caribou? <laughs> uh, or if I said, you know, uh, the caribou spirit is part of me and part of its spirit, or, and I'm part of its spirit, what might you think? Well, you might think maybe the university shouldn't have hired me and put me in front of students. Um, you, might be, you might think that I'm suffering from some kind of mental delusion and uh, need some kind of treatment. Um, or you could just think, geez, Anita, you're spending way too much time with caribou. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> thank you. Um, and now I'll ask, uh, how different do you think your life would be? Uh, so think about your own life. How, think, how different do you think your experience in this world would be uh, if you were raised as a child through to adulthood to know for a fact that you were brothers with the caribou, that they were your relatives? So what decisions do you think you might make when you were growing up and throughout your life? And how would you think differently about animals if that was your truth? And then how would you treat those animals? <clears throat> so of course, I don't pretend to know the answers to these questions because I don't come from that culture. Um, I'm just trying to highlight how different and foreign other people's beliefs can be. Uh, and that's because we have different worldviews, right? So I think now, it might be a good time to um, uh, contrast the differences between indigenous and Western worldviews. Um, I just want to say I'm not referring to any indigenous, particular indigenous group here, uh, and I'm not saying that every member of um, every member within the Western culture, uh, you know, b believes in these worldviews necessarily either. Uh, they're just generalizations. Uh, so some of these contrasts are, have come from uh, Bob Joseph at the Indigenous Corp Inc. website, and some are just um, uh, ones I've added based on my own experience. So the first contrast I want to list here uh, is that Indigenous peoples tend to have a spiritually oriented society. Um, so they believe, or often believe, that all things have a spirit. Animals, plants, rocks, water, the moon. Um, obviously, this is, is in contrast to our Western worldview. Um, uh, certainly nothing that I was taught in the Canadian school system. Um, so it's interesting. So I think it's really unlikely that a Western scientist uh, would claim for fact that humans have a spirit, uh, like in a research perspective, right? Uh, let alone a rock having a spirit. So um, now the scientists might believe that humans have a spirit, but it's probably not going to claim that. And so there's this division between belief and reality in the Western worldview. And this division isn't so distinct in indigenous worldviews, or traditionally. Um, so it's interesting to note, just getting back to language for a minute, that this dichotomy, so animate or inanimate, so with or without a soul, or a spirit, or either or, uh, lots of these uh, dichotomies, they don't actually exist in the languages themselves, right? So everything has a spirit, and everything has knowledge. And, and so there's room, from a language perspective, uh, to allow people to learn from the others that are in the world. 
Uh, so from the trees and the rocks and the animals. Uh, in a Western worldview, we're raised to be skeptical and within that scientific framework to require proof for the basis of our beliefs. So the second contrast um, is uh, that indigenous worldviews tend to allow for many truths. So, and those, tru those truths don't necessarily have to be reconciled with each other. So every individual, every individual has their own experience and therefore their own truth. Um, and those truths are respected by the community. Uh, Western doctrine is contrast seeks to find kind of one ultimate truth, um, kind, kind of a science-based approach, I guess. The third contrast I have here has to do about um, relatedness. So indigenous cultures see everything as being related. Humans and animals and the earth and the air uh, are all connected, and our identities as individuals are hugely shaped by our connections to others. So we have to look at our relationships with others as a sign of personal success. It's huge on a, on a scale of success is our relationships. Um, and that's very different from the Western norm. We tend to compartmentalize things, I think. Um, so for example, you know, I think you know, from a science-based perspective, especially historically anyways, we would always study small individual parts of the whole. Um, if you think about ecological processes, which are very large and very complex, when you're just studying those smaller parts, um, they don't always work out well when you try to put them back into the whole. So the fourth one here has to do with the land. So indigenous peoples are very, very strongly connected to uh, their traditional territories and with the land. Um, they might even uh, see themselves as inseparable from the land. So the earth is sacred and the mother of all things. She provides um, and she can't be owned. Um, Western view tends towards the land as a resource, um, something that is definitely owned uh, and oftentimes exploited. So going on here to the fifth one. Uh, so this has to do with the, um, the concept of time. So instead of being linear and moving from here into the future, as it is in our Western worldview, um, time is seen as being more cyclical and repetitive. So it represents a constant flux, and we see that flux uh, when we observe all patterns in nature. So we ch see changes in the seasons and we have ceremonies, many, many ceremonies, about renewal to ensure those cycl cyclical patterns continue. And so uh, many indigenous peoples have their own calendars. Example, For example, the uh, Ojibwe calendar, so we're in September, this would be the, the moon of falling leaves. Um, the Woodland Cree also have their own calendar. Um, this would be September's the rutting moon. So this is where bull moose scrape off the velvet on their antlers and go through rutting, uh, which is uh, the mating season. Um, interestingly, the Cree also have six seasons. So besides the four that we're all familiar with, they have also freeze up and break up. Uh, and that reflects when the ice comes in and goes out, right? Um, so I'm not Cree, that's not my heritage at all. But I grew up with these six seasons as well. Um, because I live 25 miles by boat from town, those times of year, freeze up and break up, were really important uh, to us and what we were doing as a family group. Um, so then the sixth difference is about social norms and where knowledge is held. So Western society, uh, we, we have written languages, we externalize our knowledge. We write books, we, write, uh, we make laws, we write them down, everybody can read them, um, and then we enforce them, right? But indigenous societies, uh, because they're mainly oral people, that's... Um, you know, there are examples of written languages, so the Cree have a written language. Um, but anyways, they tend to internalize a great deal of their values and their beliefs so that every single individual would hold that uh, within themselves. So the set of contrasts that I point out here is that how, where we prioritize our place as humans in, in the world. So Western thought tends to operate with humans at the apex, uh, you know, above animals and above the environment. Um, Indigenous cultures see themselves as part of the environment. Uh, and so humans are of the earth. They're not on the earth. Um, and then the last contrast that I list here is about the, um, the value of balance. So indigenous people see the ability to sustain balance in one's life as a strength. So sustaining balance involves being, to some degree, self-sufficient. Um, and to some extent, that requires knowing a little about a lot of things. Uh, so essentially kind of being a generalist. Um, so being a generalist is very highly valued. Uh, in Western culture, we tend to favor specialists, and we have hierarchies for 
for jobs and stuff like that. Um, and, and so in Western culture, uh, there's a tendency to maintain balance as opposed to sustain balance. Um, and we think in terms of controlling or dominating things to maintain that balance. So just to summarize, um, all things are animate and imbued with spirit. Uh, time is cyclical and based on renewal. Humans are not the most important thing on the earth. Um, everything has value and it's intrinsic value. And then uh, the earth is mother of all things, must be protected. Um, strength is living in balance. And then individuals hold the social code within. So I just wanted to recap on these because these, differ these differences will shed some light on how animals are ultimately viewed in other cultures. Again, these are broad generalizations. So how do these differences actually play out then in, how we, uh, in terms of animals and how we treat animals? So many indigenous people would argue that animals and humans can't be separated at all, um, and that how you treat an animal will affect whether they are actually in your life. So from a hunting perspective, uh, many indigenous societies believe that an animal will only offer up its body if the correct treatment is given to them. So this could mean not over-harvesting that animal. Don't, don't take more than is required. Um, killing as quickly as possible or uh, giving a good death is another way of saying that. Um, using all of the animal, wasting nothing, and then sharing the harvest with the other people that might need it. So those are like the most familiar ones I grew up learning. Uh, but really, there's many other different ways that cultures would respect an animal. So for example, not stepping in its blood, and, and there's many, many more. Um, a great example here would be uh, the Inuit, uh, an Inuit perspective. So they believe that whales are sentient beings, and they share the same social space as humans and other animals. And so maintaining that relationship through proper conduct is essential. And that's because if you have no respect that is going to lead to having no relationship with that animal, or that being, I should say. And when there's no relationship, there's no hunting. And in a culture like Inuit culture, uh, when you have no hunting, you have, you have no people. Uh, their culture is so um, dependent upon the animals in which they, uh, they use as food, right? Um, so... Many people in today's Western-dominated uh, world might see hunting as primitive or unnecessary. Uh, you know, really, as modern humans, we've made so much headway in domesticating all of these species, a full range of species. Uh, we rear them in these spaces. You know, we provide them with everything that they need, and then they're humanely slaughtered for food. Um, it's been my experience that many people see killing a wild animal as only a unnecessary and a violent act. And so I would argue against that, you know, given my personal perspective or my personal experience of both hunting with my family and then working in animal production systems as a researcher. Uh, but the point here is that um, cultures that depend on animals have a social mechanism. They follow to protect those species as a whole. And it's based on respect and an intrinsic value for that animal in its own right. Um, the social mechanism really stems from a different belief system. Uh, than, the rest, than the Western one that we tend to have. So we can look at that same situation from a Western perspective. Over-harvesting depletes the population, eventually affects humans through lack of food or resources, right? We get the same ultimate answer, uh, but the way we've gotten there is really completely different. So now I'm going to talk about some common um, ways that animals are represented in Indigenous cultures. Probably one of the best known ways is through dudums. So dudums is actually an Anishinaabe word that was borrowed into English, which is very interesting. Um, and uh, so t today we use the word totems. That's the word we use in English. But different totem animals were used to represent different families um, and different clans. And these were used for making marriages um, uh, and for um, finding traditional occupations and the division of labor and work. And they were also used to foster and uh, build intertribal relationships. Um, these kinship relationships are really complex. Um, they vary across groups. I don't claim to understand them at all. Um, but I do know that the totems, the totem animals anyways, um, they change across, across regions and the country. 
although they might stay the same, it is really, it's very complex. So just some pictures here. So this is, these are actually really beautiful paintings by Mark Anthony Jacobson, who's a well-known artist. So this is a bear, a very classic totem that actually you'll find right across the country of Canada. Um, the porcupine, I don't really know that much about it in terms of its totemness. <laughs> and then the deer. And then, so another really well-known example is uh, Animals as Spirit Guides to Individuals. Um, this often takes place through a ceremony. And so that particular animal spirit will guide that individual throughout their entire life. I just want to say, talking about these examples, really to give them any justice would take hours and hours and probably even days. Um, so this is an, also an incomplete list, um, but I just apologize for, apologize for not having enough time to, um, to talk more about them. So animals were also used uh, commonly as teachers. So people would learn by going out and actually observing through direct observation of wild animals. And sometimes this would be directed by, from an elder, right? Um, they would direct a person to go and observe a specific animal because they knew that that person should learn something from it. So they wouldn't engage, in the anim engage with the animal or disrupt its behavior in any way. Um, but they might also learn from the animal through visions or, um, visions or dreams of that animal. So animals were and still are mimicked uh, a lot by indigenous people for numerous purposes. Uh, so for ceremony, uh, dances, um, they're also, uh, they would also be used for in, in hunting practices. So for luring animals towards things or moving animals in particular fashion. Um, and then in terms of doctoring patients, healers might invoke the spirit of an animal in order for that animal to do the healing through them. So some other healers might also dream continually about a specific animal to restore their own healing powers, or others might get the power to heal from a specific animal, um, and that might go, say, into their hands so they could heal with their hands. Um, and they would also use animals in a meditative way. Um, so before battle in order to develop combative skills. So for example, an, an indigenous warrior who invokes the hawk as a spirit helper would wear hawk feathers um, and meditate on his swiftness uh, in order to avoid uh, attacks, right? Or, for example, a scout might um, meditate on the mountain goat uh, for the obvious reasons of remaining sure-footed, uh, you know, if he's in steep terrain. Uh, so the warrior moves like the animal, is protected by the animal. He might engage the animal helper. And then on a deeper level of dream and vision, he actually is the animal. So here's a picture here to kind of demonstrate this. This is a photograph taken in 1908. Um, it is a Cheyenne Animal Dance, and this has to do with water right purification, just to <laughs> highlight that. So now I'm going to talk about myth. So I find myths very, very interesting, um, and they're a really important way that animals are used uh, within indigenous cultures. So myths, legends, teachings, and stories um, there are probably literally hundreds, well, thousands, I would think, if you go across North America, across North America. There's, you know, there could be tens of thousands. I actually don't know. I just know that they're very pervasive in indigenous culture. So a typical Western view of myth might be that it's just a simple story. Um, we can think of like the Brothers Grimm and some of those stories. Um, but within indigenous culture, it's, I think it's more appropriate to look at myth as kind of a living reality for the people in that culture. Uh, or even like an ever-present truth. Uh, often these myths, uh, animals and humans interchange forms. Uh, so there's like a fluidity between the human form and the animal form and an animal form. And I think this speaks very closely to the, uh, how indigenous people feel about their animal counterparts. They see themselves as more similar than different, right? Um, so there's <coughs> certain characters like the trickster. So this is the trickster. Uh, he's the coyote. And he plays actually in lots of different cultures, indigenous cultures. Um, uh, so, you know, these characters might take the form of an animal or a spirit. Uh, and, and of course, there's many, many other animals just similar to this one uh, where they would have a specific character or personality, right? And one really interesting uh, way that myth was used was in teaching or passing down laws, right? Indigenous law. So, for example, uh, in an... Anishinaabeg traditional law, animals were often the lawmakers. So 
just going to take a drink of water here. So I'm going to end off by giving an example. This is the story. <laughs> this is a, uh, how an animal myth can be interpreted in a more Western framework, okay? We're going to call this case, it's a legal case, and it's going to be called Nanabush versus the Deer. And I have to say that this example was actually taken from Rachel Forbes, and she highlights that this myth is an example of indigenous law. Um, and it's actually her that puts it in this perspective, but it's my understanding that she had um, guidance and direction from the community on this interpretation. So does anybody know this story? Okay. Um, anyone familiar with Nanabush? Also called Nanabush. Yeah, some people, but probably. Um, so uh, Nanabush is a prominent spirit in Ojibwe and Algonquin storytelling. We actually had in grade like three to five. We used to have books all over all over our library, anyways, um, that were stories and adventures of Nanabush. So first, I'll read the myth. In this, this is the abbreviated form. So obviously, when an elder might be telling it, um, because it is somewhat pervasive across different groups. Um, they would, you know, uh, it might be more specific to an area and it would be longer and there would be more details and everything in it, right? So I'm going to read the case of Nanabush versus the deer. So, Nanabush plays a trick on a deer and, a, and deliberately puts the deer in a vulnerable position. In that moment of vulnerability, Nanabush kills the deer and then roasts its body for dinner. While he is sleeping and waiting for the deer to be cooked, the wolf people come by and take the deer. Nanabush wakes up hungry and out of desperation transforms into a snake and eats the brains out of the deer head. Once full, he's stuck inside the head and transforms back into its original, his original shape, uh, but with the deer head still stuck on. He is then chased and nearly killed by the hunters who mistake him for a real deer. Okay? So, <laughs> so... Now we're going to look at it from a more Western perspective, in a, almost a more legal perspective, right? okay? So in a legal context, uh, Nanabush, number one, Nanabush violates the rights of the deer as well as the treaty that the people have with the deer. So the treaty that the people have with the deer is to hunt them with respect, right? Um, uh, number two, he breaks the law by taking, uh, by taking things through trickery uh, and by causing harm when he should have shown respect, right? Number three... Because his actions were in accordance with the Anishinaabeg uh, legal principles, he is punished. And then number four, Nanabush ultimately loses what he desperately wanted uh, and ends up being almost killed in the process. So this myth is meant to remind the Anishinaabeg people for, uh, to respect animals in both life and death and that the benefits those animals provide or the gifts that they might give, if you will, uh, will only come when respect is given. So... I think this is just a really interesting example of how animals hold important place in indigenous culture. In this example, animals are teaching the laws of respecting animals. So it's just very cyclical and interesting in that sense. Um, looking at the time here, I think I'm going to do some summarizing. Um, so I would say, to summarize, Obviously, there is many, many different indigenous worldviews. Um, but, you know, number one, animals play a significant, multifaceted role in North American indigenous cultures. They're everywhere. Um, they represent everything. Um, number two, indigenous peoples uh, traditionally saw more similarities than they saw differences uh, between themselves and animals. Uh, and that was in very critical ways. Um, you know, they saw, them, they saw animals as sentient, and they saw them as kin, right? Um, and number three, even though, even though indigenous cultures differ significantly, there's this consistent common thread uh, on how animals must be treated, and, and that's with respect, right? Um, I want to say, too, that I've hardly even considered the tip of the iceberg in talking about uh, how animals fit into indigenous cultures. Uh, it's an incomplete snapshot, as I said, um, and I haven't been able to include a full range of examples here. Um, I also want to say, if I've mentioned your culture at all in this presentation, um, and you think that I've done so incorrectly, or you just want to comment on it, please uh, raise your hand, or come and see me, or send me an email, or something, because um, I definitely don't mean to offend anybody if I've gotten something just a little bit uh, incorrect. Um, and so I think I'm going to leave you uh, with some last thoughts. So these are um, two quotes from Chief Seattle, who is 
up on this side, and then Chief Dan George, which is up on that side. Um, and Chief Seattle, both of these uh, chiefs were well known for their environmental ethic and speaking out about it. Um, Chief Seattle, that's what the city of Seattle is named after. Um, and he was uh, Duwamish, he's from the Duwamish tribe in Washington. And then Chief Dan George, um, he's Coast Salish, so he's from the DC area. Um, and he was like an actor and a poet and a musician and everything like that. I think he's nominated for Golden Globes and Academy Awards and stuff like that, but it, very much an environmental um, ethics person as well. And with that, I guess I will finish my seminar and anybody can answer questions. Ask questions. Ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> you can answer them too. <laughs>